closet, Sanic <laughs> fanboy. Oh, man. This week on Backward Compatible, investment can make a huge difference in audience engagement, whether you're watching sports or playing a video game. What kinds of investment are there, and how do you encourage it? Plus, the crew makes some shameful gaming confessions. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. All right, we're here with Backward Compatible's second podcast. Uh, hopefully the first one was, uh, you know, not too much of a deterrent. We talked about some pretty uh, heavy topics with the state of men and women in games and <laughs> how much we hate Call of Duty. Not really, but... <laughs> so this one, I think we're going to start off with a bit of fun. I think Jim here has a game that we're going to play. Yes. Uh, yes, I do, uh, Richard, and we're also here with Chris. Hello, I'm Chris. Yes. And um, so let's see, we've got the whole uh, Backward Compatible crew here, and uh, just to kind of uh, get to know, so you can get to know us better, and so that we can get to know each other a little better, um, we're just going to come up with uh, three embarrassing, shameful, or just plain pathetic personal moments that are in some way related to video games. You should have plenty of those. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I, I've got plenty. I actually had trouble narrowing my list down. I think I have about five, so, um, but there's, there, there's kind of a catch here. Uh, well, first, let's couple examples of what you might hear um things like you know using an aimbot to win in an, in an fps that's pretty shameful pretty disgraceful um you know maybe you've gotten into a fight with a friend or maybe a sibling over a video game or fought over a controller thrown a controller things like that i've stabbed many people over mario party <laughs> well we all have i'm pretty that, that mario kart smash bros i mean how many stabbings can we attribute to super smash mario bros? and like nintendo are involved in a lot of friend on friend violence oh yeah oh yeah surely on purpose funny for being like the uh, kind of like family friendly brand most of the time <laughs> so uh but there's a catch to this game and one of these confessions out of the three is going to be completely made up totally bogus didn't happen um, and what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to guess which one is the correct one. And we'll ask each other questions to kind of try to ferret it out, see, you know, who breaks down first. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with Richard here, and he's going to have some shocking, possibly titillating uh, confessions. Very disgusting. <laughs> well, they're going to be disgusting. Uh, so take it away. All right. You got so, three of them. Yep, all right. I got three. I got three. Okay. All right. So all of these are, well... Most of them are nefarious. Some of them are just sad. Um, the first one is uh, that you know that I'm an extensive WoW player. Played for years mm -hmm. since I was like 11 or 12. Yep. Um, so when I used to play WoW, I only played for a certain amount of it. I botted extensively. I logged hundreds and hundreds of hours of botting battlegrounds and herb gathering and mining. Uh, at the beginning of the Burning Crusade, one of my characters had over 290 days played on it oh. because it was my botting character. And I sat in battlegrounds and mined all of the ore <laughs> when I was at school. That is shameful. Yep. And it mm -hmm. sounds very true to me. So yeah. far. That's exactly like something you would do. Anything to get an edge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so sure, but we'll find out the other We'll one. find out, yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. We'll ask questions about them later, yeah. after all. So the second one is uh, if cheats are available in a game, I almost can't stop myself from using them. Like, in The Sims, hmm. I can't play that game because it's a simple, like, one word password entry in the command console to give yourself like infinite simoleons and whatnot. So I just can't play that game. Same with um, like in the old GTAs, I could not stop myself from giving myself like infinite guns and ammo and all that, even when progressing through the campaign. Like, you know, that's fine if you've already beaten the game and you're just running around the city and just doing random stuff, but from the beginning, I would just. All right, cheat code, all the weapons, infinite ammo, let's go. All right, okay. I'm not so sure about that one, just because I know you I know you like to play with the rules, at least when we're playing analog games. I'm not sure if that extends to video games. Though. Right. All right, so what's your third one? 
All right, the third one is a bit more shameful. Um, oh, joy. So I play a lot of games like uh, Hearthstone, you know, on the iPad and mm -hmm. computer. I play a lot of free-to-play MMOs, you know, lots of games like that. I play a lot of Dota. I have spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on microtransactions and free-to-play <laughs> games. I actually would believe that. Yeah. I would believe that. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I have got bought so many custom character skins, and, you know, if I'm playing Hearthstone, you know, and I don't feel like doing my daily quests or whatever, I'll just sink the money in to play the arena mode. You know, I'll, um, if I'm playing, like, back in EverQuest 2, uh, SOE, Sony Online Entertainment, they introduced, like, an in-game uh, purchasing system where you could pay real money to get, like, equipment yes. and whatnot in the yes. game. Did that, you know? Uh, I guess it's not the same thing, but I bought gold in WoW. Yeah. You know, so I I've think spent, everyone bought a little bit yeah. of gold in WoW. <laughs> but that's like, I've spent so much money on microtransactions and free-to-play stuff, mm -hmm. cosmetic stuff, that... Recently, when we all played Wolfenstein, I bought the game by using the Steam Marketplace and just selling, like, a tiny fraction of my Dota 2 character nice. skin items. So oh, it's wow. like, oh, you now have such and such money in your Steam wallet. Go buy ten games. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so now at this point in the game, and, and we'll iron out the... When, if we play the game, a game again, which we probably will, we'll iron out some of the kings. Um, at this point in the game, normally we would go through each one and, and see if we have any questions for you, just kind of see, like, if we can try to stump you. Um, you provided a lot of information on each of them, which normally we'd want to hold back a little bit. Oh, and see, save I'm, it just, for, I'm an open book. Right, <laughs> to, to save it for questions. Like, keep it to short, and then, like, we'll ask the question, then you elaborate as much as, like, you know. So it feels like you're you're struggling to give more information away if yeah. you ask the right questions. But that's cool, but uh, you gave a lot of information, but uh, we'll see right now. Chris, do you have any questions for Richard? I'll see if I have some as well. For any of the three that he mentioned. Right. We can also ask him to kind of give us a quick, like, real... Yeah. What was so, it botting WoW, yeah. I can't stop myself from using cheat codes, mm -hmm. and I've spent lots of money on microtransactions and free-to-play. Now, you say, when you say botting, botting and WoW, um, did you just use that for... Gathering up like uh, your other other skills like um, herbalism and yeah, I mean all uh, of mining. the above. I had characters that would bot mining. You know, I have like even back in vanilla when the bots were really young. You know, right. I'd go to yes. like uh, Searing Gorge or whatever and like have them farm adamantium or was it adamantium or mithril? I don't remember. I think it was that. I think it was adamantium. I don't remember. I don't remember either, but I think so. I yeah. don't think they used I think it. that was a BC mat. But and then I bought a battlegrounds, you know, like my yes. character would be one of those that would, you know, I'm gonna run to this flag and then sit here idling for fifty seconds and then I'm gonna run to this flag oh, even I if there's have, like I might have killed you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so okay. So you did even bot in the arena. No, 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 not the arena. Not the arena. No, I was Just a hardcore arena rounds. player. Just in the battle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so my question actually regarding that, because I've actually never known how botting works, is how does it work? Like, do you, like, write, like, a macro or something that it follows? No, or? no, no. So, well, I mean, I guess you could. There were some, in, like, Final Fantasy XI, um, they actually had an in-game macro system that was so robust that you could write your own, like, perpetuating, like, recursive macros that yes. would, like, a fishing bot in Final Fantasy XI, <laughs> was just a macro that you kept on using with like your Windows macro options. Mm -hmm. um, but like, for example, one of the ones that I used for a long time was uh, MMO Viper, mm -hmm. and it's essentially a program that it traces the, uh, the length and width of your screen, and it knows exactly where to click to do various ah, things. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You sound pretty knowledgeable about this. <laughs> I know your your second one was that you, you can't help yourself when you cheat in, in video games. Yeah. And this is specifically only applies to video games. Right, right, yeah. Games okay. where it's like there are, is a system in place where if you hit this combination okay. of buttons, cheat codes so, are So you're galore. not ready to admit to all your cheating I'm not, in you know, analog I'm, games. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> It would explain why you always win. It would. <laughs> really uh, when you look up these cheat codes, you're, is it the first thing that you do when you buy the game, or do you get to a point where if you feel the slightest bit of frustration, you immediately hop on and look for the cheat? Well, no, it's more like for like when I'm playing The Sims. You know, I know that the money thing exists, and I don't want to sit there and wait and wait and wait mm -hmm. for my Sim oh, to I collect can, their money in advance. I, I can totally understand that, honestly. Like, 
something like that. You kind of want to play just like for creative mode. Yeah, sure. And so it's like, yeah. give me all the monies, let me build my house, and then like, you know, I don't, I don't care to sit here and play this game. Yeah, and then like in. Uh, like in GTA, you know, when uh, you would die and lose all of your guns and all of your weapons, or if maybe that was only when you got arrested, I don't know. But like, I would hate having to go beat up 500 random people getting 20 bucks at a time to go restock on stuff when all I want to do is as soon as they let me out of the police station for whatever reason I, the police force in this game is yeah. really lackluster yeah. I just pull out a rocket launcher and go back to work, yeah, you yeah. know Okay, and the third one, did you say the third one more time? Yeah, the third one was that I've spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on like microtransactions and free okay. games. I don't think we even I need think, to ask about this one. Yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> ask about that one. I think, um, I personally think that the one that is the least likely is your second one. Mm -hmm. um, just because I think that maybe you have, I'm, I'm sure you have used cheats before, everyone has, but I don't think it's... Um, this compulsion that you're talking about, this you have to do it every time you start. I'm tending to agree. And what do you actually. think, Chris? I, I'm starting you to agree. Pick the same one because you were specific enough with the botting thing okay. that either you've done it, maybe not to the same extent that you said, mm. or you knew people who botted, so that gave you knowledge. Okay. But I'm kind of thinking you're not the compulsive well, cheater. If, if we if, if we both pick the same one, and it's not that one, then neither of us win. Yeah, I guess and he wins. All right, Richard. So which is it? All right. Well, you both win. So. Ah. <laughs> Yes. I am both simultaneously <laughs> offended that I lost and happy that you think I'm not a cheater. <laughs> I didn't think you were to begin with, except for when you play analog games. Only with me and only when I lose. But now, you know, we, we have confirmed my shameful third confession that I have spent way too much money. <laughs> oh, I was expecting that one. Yeah. And the botting, uh, that one, it surprised me a little bit, but not really when I stopped to think about it a bit. No, nah, like so. in Final Fantasy XIV, when, you know, when that came out this past, I guess it was like November that it came out. Right. I don't remember. Right. Um, man, I botted the hell out of that game. Uh, it, it got to the point where botting was so rampant in that game that the the currency was devalued to this pitiable amount. And uh, nice. Square, they finally got on the ball and like released all of this stuff that they had promised, like player housing, which you spend an exorbitant exorbitant amount of money on. And when you do that. It takes some of this money out of the out of the economy, so the money is worth more because there's less of it. But so I had quit playing because it just there was no content, and my old roommate was still playing, and he was like, you know, hey, don't you have like, you know, tens of millions of gil in this game? You know, a whole player like a guild house is like. Five million or something like that, and I was like, "Yeah, sure. If you pay for my subscription to get my character back on, I'll give you like tens of millions of in-game gold." Nice. And I did. <laughs> Very nice. So, what you're saying is that uh, you like big bots, and you cannot lie. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Chris, I guess we can move on. Okay. What are what are your uh, your three? All right. So um, you're familiar with the game Shadow the Hedgehog 2006 or 2005, somewhere in that range. Recently, yes. as of Game Grumps. Yeah. yeah, Game Grumps was playing it recently. Um, I've actually played the entire game. Like, all the endings, final secret ending, everything. Oh, that's disgusting. That is. <laughs> so you're, you're confessing to be a, a Sonic fan. Yes. A Sanic fan. A Sanic, a Sanic fan. Sanic fan. Sanic the Hedgehog or whatever. Yeah, I guess. Oh, man, got to get the Chaos Emerald. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, I'm hoping that's not the one. Yeah, I'm hoping that's not the one. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm, I've always been a huge admirer of strategy games, but I'm absolutely horrible at them. And so um, single player like StarCraft, WarCraft, like, you know, StarCraft 1, WarCraft 2, WarCraft 3, I could never beat those campaigns without cheats. Even the campaigns? Even the Ooh. campaigns. Save the questions. We'll save the questions. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm just as shocked as you. We'll let them get through all of it first. All right. Number um, three. And then number three, um, in Smash Bros, um, I'm better now, but when I was younger, the only way I could ever win was by lurking. Um, so I would do that whole like shameful, cowardly strategy of like sitting oh, back, or you like sit off in the background yeah, and let yeah. other people fight. Yeah, let them fight, and then sort of like you know jump in with your five stocks to take out the last person when he's at like 140 percent. You know, so. I hate you. <laughs> Get, out. <laughs> Get out. I hate you and everyone like you. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so let's see. So questions. Uh, Richard, do you have any questions first off? Yeah. Okay. So in Shadow the Hedgehog. Mm -hmm. You're saying that you did every... Because that game has, like, branching yes. story, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. Like, you did every single one? Yep. 
There's no fucking way. <laughs> There's no. How, how extensive? Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I didn't play much of that game. Well, I don't know exactly how long the game is because it's a piece of garbage. And but this was the one with the like with the werehog, right? Or am I thinking of a different? No, game? no. no werehog with Sonic Unleashed. Oh, okay. That was the one that I played some oh. of, and it was pretty bad. Also, too. I know that. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. I think this one might be true. Oh, he's an no. out of the closet Sanic fanboy. Oh man! All right. What was the second one? The second one was uh, needing to cheat on a uh, Warcraft and Starcraft to beat the campaigns. Man, the campaign. She cheated in what way? Like, 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 it, like, the, like, like all your base are yeah, to and us. it's a good day to die, yeah. and like all those. So the single, so single player campaigns, mm -hmm. and you have to use the actual the console commands to give yourself different advantages. like gold or invincibility that sort of thing. Yeah. And what was why couldn't you beat them normally? Uh, mainly because when I played them, I was too young to really be good at it. How young are we talking? Um, middle school, high school. Okay. And what difficulty were you playing at? Uh, normal. So you refused to lower the difficulty, but you cheated? Well, I think on early on I did easy, but then I went to normal. Because when you're cheating, it doesn't so really you, matter the difficulty. You cheated on easy? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> you might be hearing, I want you to, I guess. I want you to confirm that you cheated on easy. <laughs> At one point in my life, I cheated on easy, yes. On StarCraft? Warcraft? Well, didn't StarCraft have multiple modes? I forget. I don't remember. It's been a while. I, yeah. I played Heart of the Swarm like twice in my life. Yeah, I was never a big StarCraft fan, and I much prefer Age of Empires, so mm, okay. I would know that one more. But Okay, so that one's interesting. And what was your third one again? Third one was he um, Lurker. L yeah. Lurker, the Lurker. And Smash Bros. Oh, yeah. you you totally seem like a Lurker. <laughs> like I just look at you and I think, well, how would he play Smash Bros? And I go, oh, Lurker. he's gonna hide off in the side. And be that really annoying person. That's see, I think the opposite. I see Chris as like this straight cut kind of individual. Really? Like, like every time like we have Ben over here at the pub, you know, and like he's whipping out like the donkey semen from our you know <laughs> issue zero podcast. Chris is just like. What's going on? <laughs> I, I feel like Chris kind of plays hard and fast by societal standards. So I think I'm going to go with the second one as the fake one. See, I, I agree with you on him playing hard and fast by societal standards, but I think that's why he lurks. Because he doesn't want to get involved. Hmm. I think it's true. And I'm going to say which one is fake is... The cheating on the, the RTS is because I just cannot believe that you would do it. I completely believe that you're a Sanic fanboy. <laughs> yeah. I think we both are in agreement on that. Are any of us right? Did you win this? So, the third one, the Smash Bros, was the fake one. Yeah! So, I'm so sure that you did that. Yes, I, I have played all the way through Shadow the Hedgehog. Now, that was when I was younger, and I didn't know any better. Yeah. yeah. See, I would, that, was, I, that was last week. So. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that not being a Smash Bros. lurker redeemed you as a human being. But, but, but then, thing, yeah. 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 And uh, regarding the StarCraft and Warcraft thing, I've never beaten the campaigns without cheats. So what happened is, like, recently, like, a couple of years ago, I tried playing Warcraft 3 again, and I was able to beat the, um, War or the, uh, the human campaign, for instance, um... Uh, without cheats. Yeah. Now, the last mission came down to me basically soloing it as Arthas yeah. um, in the human campaign. But um, I didn't, like, bother to finish the whole thing. So. Oh, man, and how good was Warcraft 3, honestly? A really good game. <laughs> uh, Alright, so what's yours, Jim? Okay, so I have some here to actually pick from, because I came up with a few extra ones. Um, because I have some pretty juicy things here, so let's... Wait, so you, wait you get more than three? I'm not going to have more than three. Oh, okay. I'm not going to say it. I just, I wrote them down right, in so case. number one is he's a cheater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm already, I'm already cheating. He, he waits till we go to uh, announce it's like, oh, actually, you're allowed five. <laughs> I just told you to bring three. Yes, okay. So, uh, number one, I quit my first playthrough of Ocarina of Time because I couldn't beat Ingo, the horse, despite several attempts, you know, when you have to... Oh, you know, the race race. Yeah, I okay. literally couldn't beat that asshole, and I got so angry that I just, I, after many, many tries, come, leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back, because there's a point in the game where you kind of have to have opponent to continue, yeah. and I literally couldn't beat him, so I just quit. The first time you have to have opponent is like Gerudo Valley, isn't it? Yes. To jump the bridge? To jump the bridge, yes, it yeah. is, and I could not couldn't get to Garuda Valley because I couldn't beat that jackass. And you okay. missed that awesome soundtrack. Well, no, you can still hear the soundtrack if you first go into the yeah. canyon. But Okay, so, um, number two. I have never finished first place in any edition of Mario Kart in 150cc. As in, one first place for the entire Grand Prix? That's a question we'll say for Okay, okay. all right. <laughs> um, and then finally... Um, I borrowed a copy of Donkey Kong for the Game Boy from a kid at school, never returned it, later told him I had lost it, 
but actually I didn't. I have the game still. Wow. Those are my... Uh, That's like legit theft right there. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to mess some things in. I All right, if any in. police officers are listening. <laughs> <laughs> or the kid who on Donkey Kong. Now you know. <laughs> That's a good game, actually. Yeah. It's a really cool game. All right, so let's jump back to uh, your first one. Yes. No, wait, no. Your first one wasn't the Mario Kart one. What was your first one? First one was I Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time. Racing Ingo. Uh, racing Ingo. Couldn't beat him. I could totally believe that. I could believe that. That race was actually pretty tough. It was. Yeah. Didn't he, like, cheat? Or... N- no. no well, he actually, just... he kind of does, but also, um, just to throw a little extra juiciness in there, I did not play this it, Ocarina of Time until I was in college, because oh, I didn't well. own it in 64. Oh, so, so it I, wasn't even I would have been, like, didn't have the skills. Yeah, I would have been about, like, 18, I guess, when I played it. First time, 18, 19. Which but, is old enough that, like, you only need, like, two or three tries. However, right. we also know that Jim is prone to controller throwing, so I would not be surprised if yeah. he rage quit a game. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised either. All right. Back to Mario Kart. Mario Kart. <laughs> so, 150cc, you have never finished first in a single race or a whole Grand Prix overall. Whole but, Grand Prix. Another okay. clarification. Um, Mario Kart franchise or Mario Kart, like, the game? Mario Kart franchise. Franchise. Any okay. of the Mario Kart games. I, I have never finished first place in a Grand Prix playing at 150cc. Which ones have you played? Um, let's see. Didn't play the SNES one. I played N64. Um, I played the one for the DS. Mm-hmm. Is that Double Dash? Double Dash was GameCube, Game and I, GameCube. I played that one probably the most. And I have played uh, the latest one, although I don't have a Wii U, so I haven't played it that much. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned the DS one, right? Did not play the one for 3DS. Okay. So that's N64, GameCube, um, DS, and Wii U. And I guess I did play the Wii one, but I think I only played that a couple... Uh, oh, yeah, I did. Mm. I did play the Wii one, because my sister has it. By the way, this could all be made up, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I could be making this all sure, up. Sure, sure. That's how it works. But my sister has it. Or does she? Uh, <laughs> or does she? It, yeah, Whoa. I played it over at her place um, several times. Okay. So the third one is you straight up stole Donkey Kong, my kid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I It couldn't... wasn't straight up. It wasn't straight up, because possession is nine-tenths of the law. And once I borrowed that game from him... It was essentially my game. Legally speaking, not a whole lot he could do about it. I can actually kind of believe that one, honestly. I, I, can kind I of was a kid, though. Yeah, I imagine Jim as a kid, like, <laughs> rubbing his hands together in his house, like, possession is nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> you know I what, though? I, I, I think I disbelieve the Mario Kart one. I'm kind of with you on that Because one. Mario Kart is so much about luck. Like, you, when you're good at Mario Kart, you can frequently do well. Like, I was able to beat in Mario Kart 8, the most recent one, all the dev times in, like, two hours. Yeah. But I have also finished straight up 12th in, like, two races in one Grand Prix mm. just because Red Shells liked the taste of my asshole. <laughs> so I think I'm going to disbelieve number two. I'm going to do the same. Really? Yeah. Okay, you're both wrong. What? Uh-huh. Oh, man. The lie was actually uh, Donkey Kong parts. Oh. Uh, yeah. Because actually that's a very similar story happened to me, and it wasn't with Donkey Kong. It was with a different game. Uh. It was with a game called Yoshi, which was a puzzle game for the Game Boy. Oh, if anyone okay. remembers. No, uh, I don't. It was, a, it was a pretty interesting, fun game. And I had someone, uh, had a kid that was sort of a friend, quote, borrow it from me. And then claim that he lost it, and then I later found the game in his, in his game collection, like, <laughs> years later. Uh, yeah. So you just kind of reversed the story. And yeah, I reversed the, the story. Did you beat so his ass? I was the victim. No, because <laughs> it, was, it was actually several years later, so it was one of those things where I was like, dude, you totally stole this from me when we were kids. And he was like, oh yeah, I guess I did, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Anyway, scumbag. Um, <laughs> actually, the whole the one question you didn't ask, actually withheld this piece of information, is kind of important uh, for the Mario Kart one. Okay. Is that that was only for when I'm playing with at least one other person. Uh. So I have beaten AI, mm. but I'm actually very bad at Mario Kart. I consistently did bad at racing, and your hint for that actually was that I was also bad at racing the uh, Ingo inside the uh, uh, of time. Yeah. 
I'm very bad at racing in general in games. I don't know what it is, but it's like I can't stay on the track. I can't Dude, stay I've been on playing course. Watch Dogs recently. So bad. I cannot drive in that game. Oh, I can't. I can't drive Grand Theft Auto. Actually, the latest Grand Theft Auto I did decent. Yeah, they improved. I actually drive quite pretty well in GTA games, but mm-hmm. man, in Watch Dogs, like, have you guys played it at all? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually very decent at driving in Watch Dogs, but man, it's, what, it's very unrealistic. Are you playing on console? Yes. Okay, I'm playing on PC. Oh, okay. And driving on the PC with mouse and Wazda. Oh, okay. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. Like, it feels... I don't know, but it feels like you have to move your mouse at the same time as you use the directional one huh. to turn a certain amount. Because if you don't, it feels like when you turn a certain direction, it turns really, really slowly. But if your mouse is facing that direction, it turns really, really fast. Similar to, like, how in Halo you used to drive the Warthog. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Did All you right. ever play um, Sleeping Dogs? Uh, no, it was but like I've heard a, really good things. Yeah, it was like a Hong Kong... Yeah, it was GTA, GTA in that, the Kung dr- Fu. The driving in that one I really liked. Because mm-hmm. it was pretty neat. You got to do this thing where you would drive... You could ram into other cars, you'd drive alongside them, and you'd kind of like shift real quick, and you'd yeah. knock them off. It was pretty neat. Um, okay, so... All right, so <laughs> I think we've uh, shared enough of our terrible, pitiable secrets. <laughs> what are we going to talk about today that isn't embarrassing and cruel? All right, so um, at the time of the recording... Um, the World Cup's happening. Actually, we uh, just advanced into the round of 16. Go USA. Woo. Oh, the um, USA did? Yeah. USA? Oh. USA all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I Lucky. believe that we will win. No, I'm not going to start that. Um, but anyway, um, I've had a few friends who have tried watching soccer recently because I recommended to them, it's like, hey, the World Cup's happening. If you're ever going to try out soccer, this is the time to do it because the games are really, really good. Um, but they still have the issue of they sit there and they watch it, and it's like a 0-0 game, and they're like, okay, why did I just watch 90 minutes of scoreless action? Um, which, if you're a big soccer fan, if it was like, you know, good 0-0, it could still be really interesting. But I noticed something else, though, that helps when you're watching soccer, is you need to kind of pick a side to root for. Um, so it's natural, like, if you've got a team that's in the game, in the hunt... Um, you know, in this case, we're all rooting for USA, or you know, some of us might not be. Unless you're a traitor. <laughs> Unless you're a commie. You know, but, uh, <laughs> um, but as soon as you're rooting for a team, those 0-0 games become super intense, because at any given moment, someone can get a breakaway score, a goal, and either put you up or put you down, and possibly hopelessly for the rest of the game. Um, so I noticed just kind of in general when you're watching sports, um, and not necessarily playing sports, or if you want to translate, translate this a bit, playing a game, um, being invested. We already know what Jim's opinion is on uh, <laughs> games as sports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, uh, esports. They're not. The... <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the whole idea of uh, being um, invested in something whether it be a game or a sport or a story, um, you know, when, it's, when you're playing something, it's a little bit different because you're involved. Um, so I think it be, might be kind of interesting to explore um, as our topic today, um, kind of like, you know, what differences are there between, like, playing something and watching something, and how does this idea of investment or agency, if you're actually, you know, participating, um, how does that sort of enhance your experience, and how do we achieve that in our design? Well... This depends on what definition of agency you're working with. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> you, you're, the, you're the ones who mentioned agency Rich, in the... Uh... Yeah, Richard has actually um, pulled out his bubble pipe. He has his <laughs> monocle in right now, um, preparing to educate us a little bit. Go, go ahead, Richard. Uh, well, just agency is one of the most like hot-button, conflicted... <laughs> get angry and throw books at other professors <laughs> issue in academia because there's there's no definition of agency that anybody wants to settle on and honestly kind of like the definition of game yeah well i mean <laughs> yeah the the field of gaming academics is like nobody wants to agree on any definition ever so there's you know the one of the first instances of agency which is just your ability to do something and then there's the concept of agency that is if you can interact with it, you have agency. Mm-hmm. But then there's what is interact. Yeah. And then you've got, like, uh, Espen Arseth is uh, a pretty big uh, writer on the concept of, like, cybertext. And he talks about, you know, if you do more than idly turn the pages and use your eyes, you're interacting with it. <laughs> so yeah. I, agency is such... Honestly, it's a bullshit issue. Okay. But, I mean... <laughs> yeah, haven't they talked about um, agency as well in... in even something as simple as like reading. Well, yeah. So there's the concept of like active and passive agency right. and all that. So, yeah. I mean, 
But let, let's just stick with the term investment then. Like the idea that you as a person, like, you know, whether you're playing it or watching it, you feel like you have, if not a stake in it, you kind of like want something to happen. Mm -hmm. So are you talking about if you, when you're playing a game, you actually care if the main character gets killed? Is that kind of what you're... I, I think you would actually go either way. Um, I think there's kind of an interesting thing to be said for people that play the game who want to win it because they want to beat the game, and it's kind of just like an outside-the-game sort of thing, and people who want to um, like maybe do that and or um, like you know, have like they want the hero to succeed because they come and care about the character. Okay, well you just mentioned like the hero to succeed, you mm -hmm. know, and so there's different things you can be invested in and the same thing, you know, if we want to use agency is like what exactly are you invested in? So say we're talking about the Walking Dead. People are typically invested when they play that game in Clementine's fate. Mm -hmm, right. You know, they yes. don't so much care about Lee, and they don't so much care about the other characters over the course of the eight episodes that are available right now. Mm -hmm, right. But um, you know, they 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 care particularly about this one person and how your actions, how your agency in this narrative affects that person. Then you've got you know in GTA or Watch Dogs, it's what influence do you exert on the game space? Yeah, yeah I think you made, brought up a good point, especially the difference there and also with, with Walking Dead is that um, Lee in particular is really just the player avatar in that space. Mm -hmm. So what you really care about is the relationship, mainly with Clementine because she's the most interesting and also the most vulnerable character, but you could potentially care about the other characters in that story as well and your relationship with them. But even as I'm talking about it, I'm saying your relationship with them. So it's yeah. like Lee is just basically you. Right. So I so I, I see kind of what you're saying. You're not you're not as concerned about bad things necessarily happening to Lee because that's kind of not the point. Yeah. Right. Um, and he's he's a character, but he's also kind of an avatar, and we're used to avatars. Right. Like just being a tool to achieve an end, essentially. Yeah. And then the world in GTA, which is another good point. Um, again, your character is even more of an avatar, I would say. There. Well, it depends on the game, GTA game, I guess. But um, your character is typically an avatar. What you're really looking at is the way that you interact with the world. Right. Um, yeah, okay. But so then, like, for example, you know, if you like the GTA example, let me bring up um, Saints Row. So you have... I haven't played Saints Row. Okay, well, so one of my issues with Saints Row, I recently played the third one. Um, and what they do is they essentially give you this open world thing to play with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can... You know, steal cars, beat people up, whatever the usual fare. With dildo um, bats. Yeah, with dildo bats. But the way you progress the game is you hit a hotkey to open up your cell phone, and you click the next mission, and suddenly you're on that mission, and the game tells you where to go and what to yeah, do. Yeah, you finish this. Yeah, and whereas in GTA and most other sandbox games, just there are different points in this world that when you drive there you can start a mission in whatever like branching or non-binary order you want to and you know that's sort of a I hate the word immersion, but you know, it's sort of where I'm going with this. Is you're more invested in the game space when you feel like it's this real persistent space. Whereas in Saints Row, it's click mission, click mission, click mission. Mm -hmm. And so Well, I was gonna say, would you say not to before you go up kind of away from the point. Sure. Would you say that that's a difference between Saints Row being more of a strict game? It's kind of gamifying the whole experience to throw another one of these terms that everyone hates in there. Gamification. Uh, gamification. <laughs> but yeah, is it is it kind of, it's it's very clear that, it's making it very clear, this is a game, these are separate levels, here's where you go to play the game, whereas GTA and some of the other games like Watch Dogs and, and uh, Sleeping Dogs, the dogs are a big factor. Um, <laughs> they they expect you to feel like this is a this is a world that you're that you're finding things to do in, and they're less missions or levels in a video game sense. So is that yeah? I mean, that's, the difference there. That's a fair argument that you could make that one is more overtly gamified than the other, but I don't think that that's a big difference in what a player's agency is in that space well, or was, what their investment is. What I was trying to imply is, is it possible that, that as you move, as you obscure the game aspect, are you increasing player investment? 
and vice versa, or is oh, that not yes. true? Because that's my question. No, I'd say that's absolutely because that's the, the implication case. that was being made. Yeah, I'd say absolutely is the the more stage curtains you put in front of the bells and whistles, mm. the more the player is invested in what's going on. So you know, uh, with for example the um, Watchdogs, they bring back the whole. There's random people on the street you can interact with. Like, you can play shell games with people in New York City. Or, no, you're in Chicago? Chicago. 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 Yeah. So you can play shell games with people on the street. You can hold up random stores. You know, you can, like, threaten store owners. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you can... um, connect with other hackers via Ubisoft servers and you know battle them in hacking games or yeah. whatever you know and so it's this much more persistent and living world that is obfuscated by all of these sort of like narrative elements whereas in Saints Row it's like very very comically presented as you know here's your miss- missions pain over here mm-hmm. if you don't want to do this stuff here then please Enjoy our simulation. I think that when you talk about investment there, what you you really are talking about immersion itself. I know you don't yeah. you may not like the word. Well, I mean, the word is fine. No, People just overuse but, it. But I say when you, I would say to use a counterpoint to that um, are the more arcadey experiences of you know the somewhat earlier days. You know, some well, retro games did this a lot, but they're still like Nintendo tends to still do games where they're very level based and structure based, and it's very clear. Um, that you're playing through a level with a with a particular objective, like right. say in Mario Galaxy, you can at any point fly to a different part of the galaxy, go into this particular level, and now you you know that you have to find the star. Sure. Um, I feel very invested in that experience, but it's in a different way. Right. So you have a different suspension of disbelief depending on the type of right. game. Right. Right. So my question would be then. Because I'm basically countering the argument I made earlier, right? Uh, but just because I think that there, I, I think that I may not have been onto something there. I kind of wanted to just bring that point up. Um, I do think that you can get really invested in a game that is very gamey or very gamey. Oh, totally. Like yeah. uh, a Pac-Man. To use something that is extremely ga- like mm-hmm. very clearly game. Just a bunch of dots and a little like you know pizza pie dude uh, flying around mm-hmm. running away from ghosts. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be a very tense experience when you're there at an arcade trying to avoid getting eaten. Um, you're going to be very, very invested, and when you get eaten, you're. Pr- and I wouldn't do this, but someone might start kicking the machine and throwing their drink all over the machine. Now, Jim would never be, do that. This would not be <laughs> let's, let's be real. When you lose, but sometimes uh, I've, I'm sure I've seen people that have done this, and clearly that's a, that's a, that person must have been very invested in that game, even yeah. though there is absolutely no way that he really thinks that he's a little, you know, okay. yellow. So the, let me let me take that and bring it into sort of like the next step of the conversation okay. in that investment is directly related to what exactly your goal is in context. Okay. So in Pac-Man, the entire game is laid in front of you. You're this dude, move around, pick up dots, don't get eaten by ghosts. You yeah. know? Uh, whereas in GTA, what is really your goal? There's no, like hard and fast one mission that you have to just do. Isn't it like steal cars and kill hookers? Is that kind (laughs) of... But so you're kind of like sarcastically picking up on my point here. The more you obfuscate the direct mechanical goal, Mm -hmm. your investment is related to different things. In Pac-Man, your investment is related to the the score counter in the right. top right of your screen. Right. Which, if you want to make the argument, the score counter is related to bragging rights, getting your name at the top of the list. Oh the yeah, UK, that definitely. Sort of yep. yes. exactly. Yeah. So you know that sort of relational goal changes based on how much the game elements are masked by narrative, you know, stage curtains. I would like to say. Mm. Or maybe, um, that's a good point, like, the thing you said about um, Grand Theft Auto and, like, you know, what what are you invested in, like, there's no specific goal, and part of that's because, like, Pac-Man's a very focused game experience, like you, like you said, it's like, collect dots, mm-hmm. clear all the dots out, move on to the next level, it gets right. harder. Right. With GTA, there's, like, so many things you can do, you can drive, you can shoot people, you can rob banks, you know, I mean, all this different stuff. Um, so in a way, when you have like this is sort of the infinite shelf problem in a sense, the more options you have, the more you kind of need to tell the player this is why you should care. Yeah. Um, and sort of tie back into the whole like sports point I was making, if we have like all these teams you could root for in a game you don't understand, why should I care? And for a lot of us, it's kind of the default of like root for the home team. 
um, or like you know is there a storyline in here like oh this guy you know uh, grew up with a poor family and like you know managed to get his big break in college and then became a pro player and or, that sort of thing or sports fact that I know mm-hmm. there's you know an openly gay NFL player now yeah. you know now maybe people are going to root for that team more because they're pro LGBT yeah. you know so there's lots of different things that you can elect to become invested in mm-hmm. but you're right there has to be a specific reason to care the more options you have right you know I, I do like the, the point that you brought up um, about having a story in sports because it really is a big thing where mm. um, they try to create some sort of a, a storyline and a reason for people that may not necessarily care if either team wins, yeah. why you might be at least interested to see mm-hmm. who wins or to see like the, the maybe the person that has never mm. won so-and-so championship yeah. to actually win. Because the, the person like in any sport who just watched the sport purely for like the form like, right. oh, that was a perfectly executed pass. That's very, very rare. So most of us need kind of a reason. Like, like even if we can appreciate it, right. we don't watch it for that, I think. I think it, I think it definitely... I think there, there's people that... I think there's people that, that do probably more than you might think watch for that reason, but the, the storyline enhances it to the point where it becomes... It becomes so much more. Like you might watch it as almost mm-hmm. like a background, mm-hmm. and I think that's the same sort of way with video games, where yeah, you if you, if you feel like which in GTA to again go back to that example and some of these other sandbox games is they give you that story, and they try to give you give you some reason to care about the main character right. or to care about the characters in that world, mm-hmm. so that you become more invested. So in then, it. In it, you know, if we accept that as being the case. In GTA, that story they present you, and in most, you know, games with some sort of obvious narrative, it's then the developers telling us what to care about. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. So how does that play in when, for example, in GTA, when I play, I would say that I'm invested in the fate and actions of my main character. Because, like, there's no, like, I, I very barely remember uh, GTA 4. You're playing as Nico. Yeah. yeah. You know, and... I didn't what like it, for as much. Well, but so what exactly was Nico's goal? Do any of you remember? Well, the whole thing was kind I want of to like... be proud American. <laughs> the, I think the whole story was predicated on the idea that like an immigrant comes to America expecting one thing and finding a totally different life waiting for him. Sure. Um, and so he he was also seeking revenge against that old guy that like you know betrayed his unit back in the war or whatever. Um, so that sort of became like the main thing later on. But the whole reason he came to America was that his cousin fed him lies about having a mansion and hooked all the time and right sort of thing. So if that's yeah. the story that we're working on, that he came to America and holy shit culture shock, mm-hmm. then the investment there is seeing Nico react in this American landscape. So every time you take an action, steal a car, knock over a hot dog stand, rob a store, or kill someone, whatever, mm-hmm. you are invested in Nico's reaction to this American landscape. Am I wrong, or would you disagree with me? That says about right. I mean, it, while, while it does make sense, I think that when people are playing, they're not... It, you don't really get that sense of, oh, Nico's this immigrant kind of fish out of water learning his way in America until you see the cutscenes. Right. Only and in the cutscenes is the shine through. This is a failure of the storytelling of Rockstar in GTA V, but predicated on the game mechanics, yeah. would that not be a good source I, of investment? Yeah, I think, it, I think that makes sense. I think... With with the with the Rockstar games and the way that they tend to tell stories, uh, one of their biggest problems has usually been they kind of have this very clear separation between the game and the story. Mm-hmm. And you have here are the cutscenes, here's the story, and even if the story might be interesting, once you're done with that cutscene, now you feel like you're not in a story anymore. You're just in the sandbox, and you can kind of play around and do whatever you want, and you don't really feel like you're telling a story or you're a part of a story or you're, you really even have a character it feels more like an avatar I think they've gotten better with that over the right. years yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's also kind of interesting in that sense too that um, when you're playing these games they're sandbox games which are supposed to be all about freedom <clears throat> but at the same time you're sort of expected to behave a certain way so in Grand Theft Auto you're expected to be the anarchist criminal essentially um, you spread chaos wherever you go either just because it's fun and as a player you like to blow stuff up um, or because the story tells you you're a criminal and you're getting involved with criminal activity. Um, but what happens if you want to say, like, while you're in the sandbox, basically play vigilante as Nico, um, and then as soon as you start a story mission, you're being told, oh, by the way, now you're the bad guy again. 
Yeah, I think that's kind of an interesting. So then, topic. let's say. Um, I mean, I very much disagree with this, but let's say that the, the the problem we've identified here is that cinematic storytelling is what matters in games, and that's what tells the player how to feel a certain way. You know, mm -hmm. you you play these side missions and you get these cutscenes, and they're telling you you're the bad guy, so you should be invested in doing bad stuff, mm -hmm. or in The Walking Dead. Which is a largely cinematic experience, right. you know. You're told how to feel by the author developer content, and they're essentially just giving you different options of what to look at. So then, in that case, you know, what about a game like Anti Chamber? Have you guys played that? I've seen, a I've bit, seen not it played it. Yeah. Okay, so in Anti Chamber, there really is no narrative. You are random person in a game space, and the whole game is trying to mess with your perspective. Uh, so you're moving through this game space, and when you look away, the level looks a certain way. And then when you turn your camera and look back, everything has changed. Uh, things are different relative to movement, to your camera perspective, the second or third time your camera collides with an object, you know? And so mm -hmm. this game was pretty popular on Steam. You know, it's still going for like 15 bucks. It's sold tons of copies. There is, I would argue, you know, very little developer narrative here. So what are people getting invested in in situations like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I think in that case, it's partially just kind of like, you know, a fascination with like, ooh, this is interesting. I've never seen this before. Mm -hmm. um, it could also just be like, hey, I beat Antichamber. And it was like a super big challenge. And in that sense, it's we kind of go back to the whole Pac-Man idea of either bragging rights or like personal satisfaction, that sort of thing, um, of like, I have a goal to beat this game, and I'm going to do whatever I have, to, whatever I have to do to get through. Okay, game. so I, okay. I mean, I don't know. I was going to disagree with that. And yeah. Say, I think I, I mean, I have not played the game. I've seen it played, but I, maybe I should go back and play it. But it sounds to me like you are getting a, sto a narrative experience there through the way that the game, uh, the way the game messes with your perceptions and mm -hmm. sort of encourages you to try to figure out um, what am I, what is really going on here? What am I really seeing? What's really happening? What is this world? What are the sort of like boundaries of this world? And, and what are the rules of the space that I'm in? Great. Yeah. So this is sort of what I wanted to, to get going is your first point, that concept of fascination. Right. You know, I think that interest, you know, as as sort of pedestrian an argument as investment in interest, you know, like, well, if it keeps my interest, I'm invested, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but that's a really interesting concept. So in a game like Antichamber, where your perception and trying to figure out essentially what the hell is going on in this space and why the rules are constantly changing mm -hmm. if that's what you're invested in <laughs> you know what does that tell us about investment that you know all you really care about is things operating under normal procedures or what what exactly is the game trying to tell us yeah i think with the game with that game it's kind of going back to the basics of a game itself is that you're just playing in that space. So you're you're experimenting, you're you're trying to learn and you're just trying to uh, you know sort of test your boundaries. So it's just like a, a an experience in play is what it sounds like to me. Is is there a central goal in this in this game? Is there even a I goal? mean there's a out of curiosity? I mean yeah I wouldn't even call it a game if there's no goal. Yeah there's essentially like you have to navigate your way to the end. Okay. So yeah. there is, there is a there is like a, a It's essentially a puzzle element. Is it like did someone watch the movie Labyrinth and then decide to make a <laughs> sci-fi-ish version? I mean, you know, it's similar in the sense that you are moving through this, you know, uh, combination of corridors and puzzle rooms that are all interconnected in some way, but when you take a left turn into what the map says should be this room, it plays with your perspective right. and, you know, and, things like that. And no David Bowie. No David Bowie. Okay, that's, and, um, that's unfortunate. And what you were saying earlier actually reminds me of, um, I'm assuming you guys both read the book, um, A Theory of Fun. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it kind of reminded me of that in the sense that, you know, if you want to sort of talk about what is fun, like, you know, just in general, um, the theory that they put forward in that book is that learning is what's fun. Um, essentially, when we play a game, a game is a system we have to learn and try to master, and it's fun to us when we like master something. We figure out like, oh, I didn't understand this before, but now I understand. And there's kind of like actually a biological, a biological reaction that we have that sort of um, encourages us to keep doing that, and that's the sensation of fun. Um, so in a way, like we were describing with antechamber and trying to get through this unfamiliar environment and be confused by things, um, that almost sounds like the investment is us wanting to get an understanding of this really weird environment 
um, or at least experience all of it until we know all of the game's tricks. Exactly. Yeah. And as soon as we've like learned all that, we feel like we've accomplished something, and that's kind of where the fun comes in. That whole sort of puzzle solving solving process. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so in that case, if we've would we would we say that we have different types of investment across oh. the games that we've spoken on? Certainly. Yes. I mean, even you know, going back to the sports example. People can get invested in the same sport for different reasons, too. So a lot of it is, I think, personal, subjective sort of stuff. I do think that game designers are intentionally trying to at least check one of the boxes. Like, I don't think that, for example, the sort of the sort of investment that you're expected to get out of The Walking Dead is the same as Antichamber, and I don't think it sure. was ever designed to be the same as Antichamber. I'd absolutely I think agree. They yeah. were both very clearly have separate directions that they're going. Mm. So then would you say that while there are different end goals of player investment that you can achieve in a game, you do have to design for one mode? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I'd say I, so. I also think that if you try to design for too many at the same time, you tend to weaken every area. Every area becomes weaker when you lose that central focus. And maybe that's something we can talk about in another another podcast to focus on perhaps games that may have spread themselves too thin and try to be a little something for everyone versus mm-hmm. trying to be a focused experience in one particular path. Well, I think that also ties into the um, eventual discussion about um, uh, budgets and team sizes and that sort of thing. You know, like maybe you can yeah. afford to spread yourself thinner if you've got the team to support it. Or maybe when you have a bigger team, you tend to lose focus because you have like, tw- you know, a couple hundred people working on a game versus having five people work on a game, you're probably going to be more focused mm-hmm. than the one with five people. It's yeah. also worth noting that Antichamber was made by one guy. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. So. Yeah. Alright, well, that's interesting. Um, so, if we have these different types of, you know, um, investment, can we try and wrap up the podcast by essentially identifying what we think they are? So, we have one, one okay. source of investment mm-hmm. is you know, as you said, from a theory of fun is just learning. Yeah. Figuring out the system. Learning the system. Okay. And so. that'd be something, you know, like the Mario example or the Pac-Man example, I think. Mm-hmm. Are, or, you are, know, lots of retro games sort of do yeah. that in that they don't have the uh, the on-screen tutorials that yeah. tell you to hit the X button mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, all right, you're playing the game now. Figure it out, you yeah. know. And so it's kind of been this big question for a long time that, you know, when they made the first Mario game, did they intentionally design it in Mm -hmm. such a way that the players knew how to play because Mario starts on the left yes. side of the screen, and you know you you know that you're supposed to be moving to the right, mm-hmm. and, you, and you start well, playing with the buttons, and then the the enemy comes, and you ha- you hit the jump button, and then you land because of the way that it's moving on the Goomba, and you go, oh, I can kill a Goomba by stepping on it. And my answer is yes, they did intentionally design it because well, Miyamoto's a genius. Well, there's, <laughs> there's also the question too with Pac-Man is um, how many uh, lives could they burn by teaching you the hard way that touching ghosts kills you, and you have to put another quarter once you figure it out. Yeah, there's. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, for arcade games, the particular subset of retro games that are on the arcade, there is, of course, that element of, of quarters. wanting to burn quarters, but I <laughs> yeah. think that tends to come from very hard difficulty more so than from the actual that too, yeah. mechanics itself. Because yeah. Yeah. normally okay. they have instructions on the side that you oh, yeah. tell you. That's okay. true. That's true. So we've got essentially figuring out the system, you know, learning the rules, Mm -hmm. things like that. Then we've got what you started the conversation with, which is essentially rooting for somebody or caring about a particular Mm -hmm. person or entity, like a a team in a sports game or a character like Clementine. Mm -hmm. So this is more of a... I mean, now I'm a bit confused because I would initially say this is a narrative thing because Mm -hmm. in games, you know, you have narrative reasons to care for Clementine. See, I I would say this, I would separate narrative from what I would, what I would call empathy. Okay. And I think in the case of, of Walking Dead, it's more, at least for me, my investment is more of an, of an empathetic, would take the empathetic route where... Um, I might empathize and feel for a particular character, in this case Clementine, and then my reactions and the, how I get invested in the game is based around that, versus a game that might be more of an interactive story in which your investment is solely based on learn, like, not learning, but reading, reading through the full story, getting the full story, getting to the end of, of what you consider an interesting reader, the same sort of investment that you would get in a novel where you want to learn all about it. Okay. So I think it's I think it's slightly different from empathy. Maybe they're maybe they're connected in a way that perhaps they interact. Okay. Well, then how about when you're rooting for a sports team? You know, are you invested in because 
you know, you want this team to be the best? Do you want them to beat a specific rival team? Can you give us your opinion on that, Chris? Uh, I, I think it really does vary a little bit because, I mean, there's sort of the people who will take an interest in a game with, with two teams that they, like, never really heard of, don't really care about, but because they hear that there's a rivalry between them or they hear about this one player that they like, but they like their story or something like that, they might sort of become more invested um, by... I don't know if proxy is the right word, um, but sort of like artificially invested. No, in I think sense. proxy is. The right word. Mm. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good point. And, and I think I think it really goes back to like the tribal um, nature because I think sports do thrive on the sort of um, the ancient tribal um, feelings, instincts that we all kind of have. That sort of we want to kind of fit in and belong. Yeah, we, we that, identify with this group and we right. want our group to be superior Ex- to the other groups. Exactly, and yeah. I think that there's there are games that tap into that as well, where you want to feel like you're a part of the team. And in sports, it's a, you're, it's sort of a, um, uh, not proxy, uh, vicariously. You're living vicariously. You're vicariously a part of that tribe uh, okay. in a sense. You're not because you're not actually playing for the team. Mm. However, you feel like because you're supporting the team, then in a way you're part of the team, and therefore their victory is mm. your victory. In a video game, it's more direct. You're part of the team. So therefore, if you succeed, your team is succeeding. So you and that's of, that sort of falls into succeeding within the mechanics of the game. Like you're just actually winning. Sort whereas, of, but I think that's also where multiplayer games okay. would, would mostly, for the most part, fit in. If you're playing either by yourself against someone else or on a team against another team, you feel like you are. You're not really beating the system. You're representing, elevating yourself within the system. Yeah. And, okay. and you're representing a part of that system too. You're representing, like, if you're playing a fighting game, you're representing, um, you know, a Dalsim from like Street Fighter Two. If you're, if you play Dalsim or like Blanca, and you lose, you've kind of disrespected the people that also play Blanca. They feel oh. like oh, I want to, like, I'm a great Blanca player, and this guy played Blanca, and he lost the tournament. Well, now I feel like shit. Okay. So you get that sort of like, and I think with especially with like fighting games, or like if you're say like watching a StarCraft feed, and you've got mm. uh, what is it, the Zerg, and like some other random, I don't know, StarCraft. Terran, Terran, Terran. Yeah. There you go, and you're like, and someone keeps winning with like Zerg or whatever, and then like someone comes in, and the next time wins with Terran, and now Terran has shit talking rights for a while because you feel like if you play <laughs> them all the time, you feel that you're kind of a part of the Terran. It, your choice was valid. And the biggest one would be, of <laughs> yeah. course, World of Warcraft or an alliance. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of more what I'm talking about. Okay. When I talk about tribe. Okay, interesting. I think that's a really good... Okay, and so I would think now that that's completely different type of um, investment from Clementine and yes. The Walking Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I agree. Yeah. So we'll say... I mean, I guess for better or worse, we can call it like tribal you know, investments you know, yeah. or societal investment. Yeah. And then you've got interpersonal investment. Mm-hmm. So like you care about Clementine mm-hmm. individually or yeah, you we, care about... We could also call it the empathetic investment. Empathetic, yeah. sure. And then you've got the sort of systemic mm-hmm. investment, learning and trying to beat the game, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, or get the highest score, mm-hmm. you know. What about... Um, earlier we talked about GTA and Saints Row. Do you think that that type of sandbox investment falls into a separate category? I don't think so. Because in a way, like, even if you're using, like, totally player-made, like, you just, you're, you're messing around, usually we have some sort of goal in our heads. Okay. Whether it's to wreak the most havoc as possible, or, like, you know, for me, I remember this one time I was playing GTA 4, and I, like, hit out in the golf thing and saw, like, wanted to see how long I could hold the cops off because the helicopters couldn't shoot me when I was inside. Yeah. Um, done that too. <laughs> so, um, but in that way, like you're sort of setting your own goal and you're trying to master the system um, in so much like as you need to to achieve said goal, even if it's you know player generated and not developer generated. So okay. I think I think those are just sort of like are their own permutations of these investments. We've already so you're started. essentially saying that sandbox games can contain a wide variety of investments, yeah. and it's sort of like the developer's prerogative to make each one appealing to the player. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, especially in sandbox games in particular, normally when you're actually playing the game itself or doing the mission, the point really is the system. If you're trying to, to master the system, learn about the system, and also test your boundaries in that system mm-hmm. to see, you know, is the game going to let me take my car and go off this, like, mini ramp and, like, fly, you know, 40 feet in the air and, like, land on a building, and will I go through a window or will it just kind of stop me like the windows made of titanium? Okay. So I, I'm glad we did this then. I think by sort of identifying what we each think are these different modes of investment, you know, we come back to the talk about GTA and other sandbox games and, you know, uh, 
there's a lot of different modes of investment and reasons to have players play your game that go into the creation of uh, what a lot of people sort of uh, insultingly refer to as like simulation, you know? Mm -hmm. But I like that. All right. So this has been a pretty great talk. Um, do we have any sort of topics that we'd like to address next time? Um, well, we could try doing that research on the... Um the like triple A space versus the indie space are just like big team, small team, big budget, small budget, yeah. pros and cons. Like what um, is what is the real um, quality of the like how much how much quality are you getting out of the money invested in your games? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we we do want to write a few articles about, maybe a series, and uh, that would be an interesting topic of discussion. I think All for right. next time. So then, this has been uh, BackwardCompatible.com's second podcast. Next time, we'll uh, do a bit of research and we'll talk to you guys about what exactly the value of um, a dollar spent in a game studio gets in an end product. Talk about the difference between indie and triple A, double A if you think that's a thing. Talk about, you know, as we talked earlier, the focus of a game and how it gets diluted when you have hundreds of people working on it as opposed to one guy, you know? So, yeah. All right, thanks for joining us here at uh, BackwardCompatible.com's second podcast. I'm Richard. I'm Jim. And I'm Chris. And uh, thanks for joining us. Peace. Backward Compatible wants you to join the discussion. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment on our site, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This week, when do you feel most invested in games, and how does that change your experience? Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.